All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Benson video podcast. And today we are talking about an important topic, the age of reform. Yes, that's right. The 1830s to the 1850s. We kind of got started with this a little while ago. Um, it's the antebellum reform movements before the Civil War. And we're talking about a lot of exciting people, a lot of exciting movements. Dorothea Dix, as you can see here with her famous program for the improving the treatment of the mentally insane. Um, lots of stuff going on. We're talking about trying to improve how we treat people who are in debt, um, fixing up our prisons and the way we treated juvenile delinquents, getting them out of the adult prisons, how we treated the mentally insane. That was Dorothea Dix, and she was involved in lots of other programs as well. Um, reducing the consumption of alcohol, temperance movements, uh, Native American rights are going to come up in this time period. Women's rights are going to come up in this time period. Um, and you can't see on the line there, abolition is going to be another issue in this time period. Um, so this is all very exciting. Lots of stuff is happening. Here's a poster from the temperance movement. These women were organizing to get their men to drink less. You get the idea. Um, we got some really important women. Oh, we also have the, of course, American International Peace Movement founded by William Ladd, which was a growing force in the pre-Civil War era, but will kind of um, not get very far in this time period. Um, Dorothea Dix was a great example of women who were really active uh, from both the Second Great Awakening from the religious side and then in the reform movement side as well. Uh, and here's some more really important famous women of the time period. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, Carrie Capp, Lucretia Mott, and... Uh, of course, the famous Susan B. Anthony. She was so central to the movement that people referred to the suffragettes, women who wanted the right to vote. They called them Susie B's. Um, she was uh, central. These women fought for a very long time for the right to vote. Um, but these women were so involved in so many reform movements and they accomplished so much, but they tended to leave their own needs last. And so this time period, they will not be successful in getting the right for women to vote. Here's another great Susan B. Anthony quote. You can take a look at that. Um, some other really important women at this time period, I'm not gonna have slides for all of them, but you've got Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, that's the first female medical school graduate. Uh, you've got Margaret Fuller, who was a literary editor running her own magazine. You've got the famous uh, Grimke sisters, the Sisters Against Slavery, who were really hardcore abolitionists fighting against slavery. Uh, you had Lucy Stone, who's famous as being the first woman who kept her maiden name when she got married, setting the stage for women um, all the way down the road to choose to keep their own names or hyphenate or whatever it is that people want to do. Um, you also have the famous Amelia Bloomer. There she is with her famous bloomers. Uh, if you're not wearing a dress, uh, then you can thank Amelia Bloomer, ladies, because she is the one who wore something resembling pants. It was like a skirt with trousers, and that's what uh, really opens the door for it to be okay to... Um, to wear pants for women, because it was actually illegal. You could get arrested for wearing pants, believe it or not. Um, this is uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton giving a speech at the famous Seneca Falls Convention, otherwise known as the 1848 Declaration of Sentiments, where she gives her famous speech, where she takes from the Declaration of Independence, all men and women are created equal. Uh, and they're demanding the right to vote, but of course their conference was met with scorn. People thought this was insane. Uh, there was so much... Um, so many people opposed to this that it doesn't get a lot off the ground. However, these reform movements tend to be quite successful in this time period. In particular, temperance, the prohibition movement, um, makes a lot of progress getting people to consume less and less. So now we're going to take a jump uh, to another topic. We're going to go past transcendentalism, which we talked about in class, and we're going to go right to the idea of the utopian communities. There was a real uh, strong um, sense of, at the time, reform and religious revivals. And so there were certain groups who started joining these utopian movements. And there was a lot of them. If you look at all those dots on the map, you can see a whole lot of stuff going on. You've got the Fourierites, the Owenites, the Oneida movement, all kinds of stuff. So this, again, is a response to the market revolution, right? This uh, major shift, people's lives changing, feeling out of control. So one response was actually to embrace change and to try to take it to the next level and to create these new communal, harmonious, cooperative societies. They're not going to work out so well, but we're going to get into that in just a second. The first one worth mentioning is the 1825 New Harmony, Indiana. These were secular, non-religious movements, right? Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to try to combine the idea of individual freedom with its spontaneity and this idea of self-fulfillment. And it's going to mix with the demands of community life, which requires discipline and hierarchy and trying to run things. And so the ideals are going to meet the reality and it's going to be 
crazy, but we'll get there. Uh, 1825, New Harmony, Indiana starts with a thousand people. Um, of course, the reality was very little harmony actually prevailed. It started out with a group of hardworking visionaries, um, with, uh, but a lot of people didn't want to get do any work because other people were going to do it for them. And really, long story short, the thing falls apart within four years. There's constant quarrels. It does, in the long run, become kind of a center for scientific studies. Uh, and it still exists today, but it's not a utopia, obviously, and it's not a communal society anymore. It's a small town of a thousand people. Um, there it is uh, in 1832. Um, you also have the infamous Brook Farm, Massachusetts. Uh, in West, Bur West Roxbury, Massachusetts, uh, founded by George Ripley. Um, this was a group of intellectuals, transcendentalists. They had this grand idea. Um, sorry, let's go back to that for a second. They had this grand idea of creating a, kind of an ideal society in harmony with God's laws. The slides are not cooperating. That's okay, though. Um, no rich, no poor, no social classes. It's actually going to work for a couple of years with its groups of intellectuals trying to farm the land and do all this fun stuff. Um, but it's going to kind of start to fall apart with infighting and all kinds of problems. Nathaniel Hawthorne actually lived there. He ended up writing one of his books about just how um, it just didn't work, how it was too idealistic. Uh, you know, the famous Scarlet Letter guy. Um, it actually ends up burning down. Nobody's quite sure where that fire came from. Uh, and then I don't have a slide for the Oneida communalism. That's the one that uh, John Green mentioned in his video. It was kind of this free love, uh, very odd, uh, an interesting kind of a place. Lasted a good 20 or 30 years, actually. Uh, when his founder passed it on to its son, though, it kind of fell apart. And now they produce, yes, silverware, pot, not pots and pans, but uh, dishes, plates and bowls and all kinds of fancy stuff. Um, I want to take a break from the hardcore history and get into a little art history. It's kind of an enjoyable little moment. I want you to enjoy some of these pictures and um, feel free to let out the oohs and the ahs if you see something that you like. Um, there was, a, during this age of reform, a sort of classical revival of Greek and Roman styles. And so we're going to see a whole bunch of buildings from this time period, like the U.S. Customs House with those, you know, classic... Um, column style. It could, looks like it could be in the Parthenon. Uh, there's Jefferson's Rotunda. Again, you're seeing that kind of classic Greek revivalism. Um, the Capitol, our Capitol's Rotunda, similar. Um, and here's one of my favorite things to talk about when it gets to art. And I was lucky enough to uh, work at the art history department when I was at the University of Pennsylvania and learned a little bit about the Hudson River School. It's uh, some of People have described it as the artistic embodiment of transcendentalism. It's transcendentalist uh, philosophy meets the art world. The Hudson River School um, had some goals. One of its goals was to capture the undiluted power of nature um, and kind of show the insignificance uh, of humans in, in kind of the context of the greater natural world. Uh, it was described as a new art for a new land. It's kind of America's first real American form of art with its grand scenic vistas and all kinds of exciting stuff. So let me just show you a couple of uh, famous examples. It's not really critical to know the names or the artists, but they're fun to look at. This is Thomas Doty's famous In Nature's Wonderland. Again, notice where the human is. He just plays a small little role in this painting. It's not about the person, it's really about the scenery. Um, this is my, one of my all-time favorites, Frederick Church. Uh, did a lot of incredible paintings. Here's his Niagara Falls. Uh, Thomas Cole with his view of the Catskills. More Thomas Cole with his oxbow. You can see the beautiful bend in the river. Again, it's this uh, really trying to capture the feel of the natural world in the paintings. He also did like a history series where he did this course of empire, the savage state. And then we progress into the Arcadian pastoral state. And then we have consummation, the creation of society and civilization, and then destruction and this exciting kind of uh, tearing apart and chaos. And then we have desolation and look what's coming back, the natural world. And so there's a sense of a cycle um, uh, and shows sort of man's place in that cycle. Kindred Spirits by Asher Duran, another famous painter of the time. Too bad I don't have more Frederick Church. I should have. Um, also, John Audubon, who was uh, involved in a lot of environmental protection and that kind of stuff at the time. Those are some of his watercolors. He made a lot of uh, plates with all these different uh, animals that we were working to conserve at the time. Uh, another, this is kind of leaving the Hudson River School and moving into the School of Nationalist Art. The pride in painting uh, these beautiful landscapes that captured the story of American history. So Boston Harbor, of course, central to the American Revolution. Um, the fur trappers descending the Missouri, <clears throat> capturing that colonial period. 
a little more. And that was kind of the transition. Those guys were considered Hudson River School, but they were doing patriotic art. Uh, the Landing of the Pilgrims. The all too famous Washington's Crossing the Delaware, one of the most famous paintings in American history. Uh, talk about your Greek and Roman revival. Here's George Washington as though he were more of a Roman god. Here's one more Frederick Church. This is a pretty cool one. Our banner in the sky, the sun setting and the colors make this kind of beautiful, surreal American flag. Uh, 